Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And is, this is the 14th show in our El Alamein series. And I kind of, at one point at the beginning of it, I thought, will we sustain the interest for 14 shows? And absolutely, we have sustained the interest. Hot topics keep coming up. Um, it's been brilliant. I thank you for your contributions. I thank you for watching. And uh, we've tackled the Australians, the New Zealanders. And today, for the first time ever, I have a South African guest. And it's really important to get that diverse set of ideas and opinions. David Brock Katz is a product of the South African Military Academy. He's a specialist in South African military history. And he's joining me now from South Africa. I should point out his book, South Africans versus Rommel, the description, the links to buy purchasing it are in the description below. Or you can buy it at your favorite bookstore or online, but I'm delighted to bring him in. So uh, it's e uh, evening where he is, evening where I am. So good evening, David. How are you? Uh, good evening. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, I'm really pleased you're here because I say you're, you're, I just said to you in the, in the pre chat before we went live, I think you're the guest from the 28th different country I've had on, which is something I'm very proud of to just spread it out and get some opinions. So let's start with how does South Africa view the western desert campaign what, what has the historiography changed over the years is it something that's talked about a lot in south africa is it something that most people don't know about kind of give us a, an understanding of where it sits in south african um kind of memory well certainly there are there are elements in in, in uh, south african society today that still commemorate uh Alamein, uh and find that it's very very important um but the vast majority of South Africans today, especially after 1994 with the democratic elections, um, have no real interest in uh, in the Second World War or our contribution to the Second World War. So there's a national amnesia. But I can't I can't just blame 1994 and the advent of a democratic dispensation over here, uh, where a large proportion of the population was alienated, and you know, we can sort of understand why they don't identify with Alamein. Although there were there was a large contingent of black people fighting mm. uh, for the Union Defence Force at that time, but anyway, it happened a long time before that. In 1948, the Nationalist government came in to power in South Africa, and they set about dismantling uh, our, our 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 history, um, uh, certainly our our military history with the, uh, in the in the First World War and the Second World War, and they just had uh, they, they just had didn't want a relationship with Great Britain at all. And uh, so since 1948, uh, our historiography has certainly, well, not the historiography, the way the politicians have treated our history has, has marginalized our history. It's has set it aside and we have a national amnesia, unfortunately. But there are certain stalwarts in certain sectors of South African society who still remember and uh, who, uh, who, who hold great store uh, in, 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 in what the UDF did during the Second World War. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, lots of countries are going through this process. We've discussed it so many times. India is going through a similar process of kind of rejecting part of its past and now embracing it. Romania is going through with the struggles of accepting its culpability in certain aspects of it. And, you know, everybody, every country is on a different place on its journey in how it's dealing Britain. with World War II. Britain, in many ways, we're stuck in this almost the ridiculous over pride we have in some of the city, the, the, the Britain standing alone nonsense that really drives me up the wall about 1940 when we were far yep. from alone. We had a massive great empire and all these other people from around the world help, helping and contributing. But everybody's on a different journey. But as far as South Africa is concerned, I mean, their role in the desert was really interesting. And, and one of the things that obviously is going to come up and folks, it's going to be a very sprawling conversation. David and, and I are just going to kind of ch chat back and forth. We welcome your questions coming in. Uh, politics are going to come into things. Differences between the cultures of countries are going to come into things. And, of course, we will discuss the various campaigns, Crusader and the Tobruk and, and El Alamein. But um, the first thing is, is when you came out of the South African Military Academy, um, is... The doctrine of World War II, did South Africa go to war with its own doctrine? Did they kind of adopt things from the empire? Give us a rough idea about what had been going on in South Africa in the 20s and the 30s and their approach to a potential world war, or did they not even think about it? No, it's a, that's, a, that's a very good question. It's, it's a very complicated question. And in fact, it goes a long way to explaining why there was friction between South African generals and British mm. generals, First World War, and Second World War. So it's an important question. 
And in fact, if you take a doctrinal approach to, 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 to the whole of this, I call it in my book, I call it a clash of military doctrine. There was a three or four way clash up in the desert. There was a clash between the Axie and, 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 and the Allies. And then within the Allies, there was a clash of doctrine between the South Africans and between the British. Doctrines, although in, in many parts similar, were quite dissimilar in other ways. So there's, uh, okay, let's talk a little bit about South African doctrine and uh, where it comes from and, and, and the process that we went through and, and, and maybe why it's a little bit different to, to what the British expected. So coming out of the South African War, we now call the Anglo-Boer War. We call it the South African War because we want to be more inclusive because it, it, it involved a lot more people than just the Boers and the mm -hmm. English. It involved a lot of uh, the other parts of the population. So we call it the South African War. So the South African War in uh, 1899 to 1902, you had the Boer Republican armies who had a very unique, not codified, but had a very unique doctrine. That was a doctrine of maneuver warfare. And it was a doctrine of, of maneuver warfare that relied on psychologically dislocating the enemy rather than relying on frontal assaults and attrition in order to wear the enemy down. So uh, the, the, the Boer republics were very, um, were very uh, worried about un expending unnecessary lives in the pursuit of, of victories. So they would rather live to fight another day. So they were accused a hell of a lot of the time of not finishing off, you know, where they had a minor victory of not really finishing it off, allowing the, the, the enemy to retreat and, and they live to fight another day because they valued the individual within their society. And this is, we can almost call this a South, a South African way of war. It's, it became inculcated in the way the South Africans fight. And there's a golden thread that runs right from then right through to the current South African National Defense Force is where we have a sensitivity to, 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 to the losses that we are prepared to suffer in pursuit of, of, of victory or fruitless assaults, etc., etc. So that's the backbone of the doctrine and the, and the type of maneuver warfare. So we don't like frontal assaults. We don't like going over the top. And we don't like sacrificing men in, in, the, in the face of machine gun fire, etc., etc. Uh, we would rather use the double envelopment, the single envelopment, uh, if things are not going well, we'd rather retreat. We're very mobile, uh, and we like to maneuver. That's that's where we're all about. And, and, and let's be fair, the British had adopted some of those ideas themselves. I mean, look at the look at the language terms the British Army has adopted from the fighting in South Africa. Corral uh, coming from Kral, Commando yes. is a is a Boer word. Yes. You know, yes. Churchill is inspired. Churchill, of course, had been out in South Africa. He's inspired mm. by some of the tactics out there, but then. But then there's this connection between our doctrines, and then there's also this separation as well, which comes yes. back to what James yes. Colvin was saying yesterday of the of the whole class mentality of the British Army and the system yes. and the and the, the old boy network that is part of our strength and also a huge part of our weakness. But no, I've absolutely. noticed it's already coming up. The the elephant in the room, so to speak, is in yes. is coming up in the sidebar is why indeed South Africa would even get involved in the war effort on the Allied side. Because there's oh, yeah, so, so let's, 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 let's address that now in that you know there's obviously well, let, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. It's, it's certainly I mean I'd like to tell you it was from totally altruistic reasons and Smuts felt young Smuts felt the loyalty to the British Empire. That was part of it. But uh, no, there was a deeper underlying reason why South Africa entered into the war, First World War and Second World War, and that was expansionism. So Africa had an eye to expanding its territorial acquisitions northwards of its current of, of, of its borders, as we know South Africa today. Mm -hmm. And in fact, written into the, the the statute that formed the Union of South Africa in 1910, is a clause. That says the South Africans will eventually take over the High Commission territories, which was Lesotho, Botswana, and Swaziland, and would also take over uh, what was then uh, Rhodesia, Zim Zimbabwe. And so it made provision in the Constitution to take over these particular territories. Um, it, it, it never came about for political reasons. We can go into that, but I don't think it's a subject of today. But uh, uh, b believe you me, South Africa was uh, was territorially acquisitive. They wanted mm. to increase territory and they jumped at the opportunity in the First World War to climb in very, very quickly and take over German Southwest Africa. And then they went for German East Africa. They got involved there. 
And what they wanted to do there was swap the territory of German East Africa, certain portions of that territory. They wanted to swap it with the Portuguese in Mozambique and then have a contiguous uh, uh, territory well to the north of the current borders here. So th that is why South Africa entered the Second World War. So much so that uh, on the second day after South Africa declared war on Germany, which I think was a couple of days later than, than Britain, I think it was September the 6th when South Africa entered the war, they sent a delegation to the, to the British Prime Minister demanding Swaziland as, uh, uh, as compensation for entering into the war. And Churchill told, Churchill told Smutsy no in certain terms to get knotted. He said, uh, how do we allow you to take over Swaziland when we're fighting a war here because Germany's just taken over Poland and all these small nations or whatever the situation is. So it's, it's not on. You know what I'm saying to you? But uh, that didn't stop South Africa, who immediately on entering the war had a planned invasion of Mozambique to take over the Portuguese territory. Never mind that the, the one of the longest lasting peace deals is between Portugal and, uh, and, and the United Kingdom. I mean, I think it's been going since 1600. They are allies, actually. Portugal. I believe so, yeah. Sounds, yeah. sounds about right. Yeah. So notwithstanding that the South Africans were going to invade Portugal, and only by chance did they not, uh, not Portugal, sorry, uh, uh, Mozambique, which is a Portuguese-held yeah, territory, yeah, yeah. only by chance they didn't do it because a couple of their trucks en route overturned and it was a bit of a fiasco. They weren't prepared properly. They called off the invasion. Only again in 1943 to decide they're going to re, re, redo it and, 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 and try and invade Mozambique again. And that was also called off. So you can see that South Africa had territorial desires. And uh, a large part of the reason, loyalty, loyalty to Britain, no doubt about it, a large part of the reason was territorial acquisition. And this is the fantastic thing. We're going down a, a, fame, a, a, a rabbit hole already is that if we were to have an Australian, New Zealand, Rhodesian, Indian, uh, and all the other uh, Commonwealth countries on, on board now and say, why did people fight in 1940 for the British? You'd get all separate reasons that would have overlaps, complete differences. But I think the average Brit in 1940 would just think everybody is fighting for King, for the, for the, M and it's, it, and there's part of it, as you said, but there's lots of other reasons there. But that's a bit of a background. And thanks reasons, very yeah. much for that. But, when we get to the Western Desert campaign, the other thing that's been a recurring theme this these over these two weeks is the the varying levels of experience that the, the, the units have before engaging the Italians and the Germans. Some have been out in the in 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 the Middle East for for you know years. Some of the pre-war British territorial units. Some are war-raised units. The New Zealanders, Australians. But the South African divisions, I mean, it, we, we ought to mention East Africa. That's 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 the, yes. the journey to get to North, the Western Desert goes to East Africa. And I've been wanting to plan an East African theme week at some point on World War II TV because Very interesting. people who think it's a sideshow, the, the, no. the numbers of people out there was in the hundreds of thousands out there. It's extraordinarily vast and complex out there. But... For the purposes of the brevity to get us to the Western Desert, run us through the South African. Who, who went? Where did they come for? What was the size of the force and how did it, how did it pan out? And I'll put a photo up on screen of South, South Africans out in East Africa. So give yeah, us a, that, the, the, uh, the a basic lesson on East Africa. Okay, that's a that's a great photograph of South African troops with their, with their distinctive pith helmets. Um, okay, so the, the Italians fielded 500,000 troops in East Africa. Uh in Somalia, and uh, most of those troops were, were black Ascari, um, and most of them were static. They didn't have really a means. They, they, they were immobile. They didn't have a means of transport. So most, most of them were posted out in static positions. The East Africans uh, were a major contributory to the, to, the, to the empire forces in East Africa, um, I think up to 35% or 40% of the troops in East Africa were South Africans. So they made a major, major contribution mm. to the British war effort there. They arrived in East Africa with a doctrine that I was telling you about. They wouldn't have looked at a place except for their, 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 their trucks. They were a motorized unit. So they were light infantry, motorized, motorized by way of truck, not mechanized, not with bring gun carriers, etc., but in trucks. And each truck, instead of carrying a, 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 a full section as it could, it carried less in a section because what they did is they put enough provisions and fuel, whatever, to last them a few days. So they were quite independent for, a, for an amount of time from the logistical lines. 
uh, not something the British practiced at all. So here you had, they, they, were, they, they, they looked like a bunch of Boer Republican forces, actually, the way they, they, they were very mobile and they believed in maneuver. And uh, then they proceeded straight away when they arrived there, they proceeded to, to attack the Italians in their static positions by using double envelopments and single envelopments and quite a lot of combined arms warfare also where they successfully used uh, the Air Force, uh, the tanks. They had very rudimentary tanks. They had armored cars also and they used them to support the infantry. And they had quite a thing going on the combined arms front. It's quite a small scale. But uh, they registered quite a lot of victories using this. They surrounded the Italians and uh, using the art of maneuver and double envelopment. They managed to dislodge the Italians from their defended positions and, 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 and quite, quite a lot of territory going forward. So they actually solidified their doctrine and they came out of East Africa with quite a solid motorized maneuver, mobile uh, 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 doctrine. Um, and also something to bear in mind is that they had their own integral uh, transport. A lot of the, the, the Allied units up north in the Western Desert didn't have, they used a motorized pool. So if you wanted to move a New Zealand brigade from one place to another, it would have to go to the pool, draw the vehicles and, and, and whatever. So the Africans did not. They had an integrated, integral, motorized a, a section that moved them around. So they were always able to move and they were highly mobile. So this is how they emerged from East Africa, veterans successful, flushed with victory, and um, already in East Africa, the, the, the abrasiveness between the British and the uh, South Africans was beginning to emerge. Pinar uh, commanded the first, uh, the first brigade in, uh, in East Africa and straight away fell out with the British generals because, exactly because of the doctrine. Whereas the, the British expected sort of frontal attacks and, 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 and expected, expected more elan in the attack, uh, Pinar would go great lengths to envelop and dislodge and uh, circumvent main points of resistance and that type of thing, and uh, which was looked upon by the British with a slightly raised eyebrow who, who said, you know, this, this is not on. Nothing's going to be uh, – we need to destroy the enemy instead of, uh, uh, you know, psychologically dislocating, etc. So really – the, uh, the, 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 the embryonic troubles between British and South African generals were setting in in East Africa. So Pinar, already when he arrived in the Western Desert, had this impression of these inflexible uh, 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 British generals that didn't really quite know how to combine arms. He was frowned upon when he used these armored cars. Instead of for reconnaissance, he used these armored cars as, as support vehicles for his infantry that was frowned upon by the British, etc., etc., etc. So already the clash of military doctrine was beginning to emerge. But East Africa was a very important campaign uh, in cementing the, 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 the South African military doctrine. Brilliant. And a rather mundane question, but an important one. Uh, the 500,000 that went to East Africa, uh, volunteers or conscripted as well? Uh, how did it break down? No, not 500,000. 500,000 Italians were in Africa. Oh, yeah, exactly. uh, South Africans, I think, were numbered between thirty and 40,000. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. I'm a little bit rusty on the figures. Sorry, yeah. But let's say a contingent between thirty and 40,000. They were made up of 50% Afrikaners, 50% English. Um, there were the black support troops also that accompanied them uh, in the support role. They weren't, they, they, they weren't given weapons. Unfortunately, that's something that they took into the to the to, into the Western Desert, which will obviously reduce South Africa's fighting power. Because once you've got segregation amongst your soldiers, it's going to reduce your fighting power. There's no doubt about it. And the South Africans were always short of personnel. Mm. So by having these segregationist policies, which the Italians didn't have, by the way, I mean the Italians fielded a black army. In yes, they did. Yep, yep. it was a black army. So the South Africans, on the other hand, uh, severely restricted their fighting power by not allowing blacks to be armed because of, 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 of political reasons, which, by the way, didn't stop um, our, 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 our black troops picking up Italian discarded weapons and arming themselves, certainly in the Western Desert. And there were pitched fights between uh, black soldiers and, and, and Axie forces. Uh, who had armed themselves, whatever, and rightly so, they did what had to be done. And there was a blind eye. I mean, in the heat of combat, these, you know, a blind eye was uh, was was turned to that. But um, just just on a, on a point also, in no way was the entry South Africa's entry in the war supported by the majority of the population. 
you had a black population that wasn't wholeheartedly supportive of, 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 of the whole idea. It did come out officially. The ANC came out and officially supported it because they saw an opportunity by blacks joining the army of bettering themselves economically. Mm. They, they, they saw a better future uh, by empowering blacks now with weapons, etc. And uh, they weren't particularly wrong with that because South Africa certainly emerged after the Second World War different to what it, what it, what it went in. But uh, there was a large proportion of the Afrikaner population who were vehemently against the war and in fact supported the Germans. A large proportion, not the majority by, by any means, but a significant large proportion supported the, supported the, the Axie forces. And so now you've got one of the only Commonwealth countries to go into the war, having a large contingent of, 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 of uh, its society back home, backing the enemy. Very interesting. And in fact, those people who were against entering the war and uh, who who backed Germany came to power in 1948. So that's 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 yeah, it, it is in my prep for this. It is a ridiculously complicated situation, but 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 fascinating. So so let's let's get to the Western Desert because the, the South Africans come out of East Africa with everything you would think. The British command wants an idea of mobile warfare, a grasp of combined arms, um, experience. Um, I could keep on going with the with the with the superlatives to describe this army, and yet Pinar has already started to um, grate with British commanders. So, so yep. they're, how does their then when when they arrive in the Western Desert, kind of how does how does the relationship begin? And obviously, it's going to deteriorate. But how did it? At, the, at that first moment there, it, it seems now with me, with 80 years of hindsight, the British commands have been welcoming, welcoming these people in with open arms and saying, what have you been doing? How has it been going for you? What's been working well? What ideas do you want to share with us that might help us out in the Western Desert? But that's probably not what happened. So what did happen, David? Well, certainly certainly the, the South Africans arrived with the with the motorized transport, light, 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 light motorized infantry, highly mobile. And a gentleman, I don't know if you've come across him, I'm sure you have Dorman Smith. Very yep, interesting. Came up in the, in the, a lot yesterday in Leslie's show. Yeah. Yep, yep. Later later became Dorman O'Gowan, I think. He found his Irish roots. Uh, yep. but anyway, he he turned around, he saw a role for the South Africans, which I think was the correct role. He turned around and he said, Look. These guys are highly mobile. The command structure is slightly different to ours. They, 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 they are more into mission command rather and directive command rather than than than, than the, 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 the way the British Army functioned. They they al 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 allow decisions to be made down to the lower levels. You know that 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 type of thing. Uh, they weren't into detailed command. So he saw a role for these South Africans as being part of the British uh, armored brigades. So the infantry component to the armored brigades, where they could have kept up with the with the with the, with the armor because they, they they traveled more or less at the same speed. That's where he saw a role straight away. When the South Africans arrived, they also wanted to they also wanted to take on a uh, a tank component uh, for safety reasons because they felt you know what we're a little bit vulnerable out here in the desert with all these tanks roaming around. Uh, you know we just a, a you know, in, in in a couple of little trucks, uh, you're not going to we're not going to last too long against uh, a full armed Panzer division. So this is their feeling as soon as they arrived. Now, and a very interesting point is you'll notice in the Western Desert that the only people who who had tanks were the British. They were the only ones that 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 ran armored brigades. None of the other contingent ran armored brigades. They were the infantry. Uh, I'm sure you've discussed it before. British didn't really know what to do with the infantry wasn't part of their doctrine. They had an interesting doctrine coming out of Basil Henry Littleheart and, 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 and JFC Fuller and others in that ilk that uh, believed that the tank was a war-winning weapon, that it really would roam the, roam the desert like a ship, unsupported by anything. Infantry was just a burden. There was that school of thought, which unfortunately uh, had a lasting effect on the British doctrine at that time. So when the, when the, when the South Africans arrived, British didn't really know what to do with him. Didn't really know what to do with him. So I mean, that was a cause of a lot of British frustrations. Is because uh, there's a, there was an incident when the 22nd Armour Brigade overran the Italians, totally unsupported by infantry, 
And the Italians surrendered in mass. And when the tanks had passed, because there's nobody to 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 um there was nobody to take them prisoner of war. Mm -hmm. When the tanks passed, they, they remanned all their positions again when the tanks had gone away because there was there was no combined arms warfare. There wasn't an infantry component. So, yeah, that was, that was the problem that faced Africa when they arrived. It, there was no... The British didn't understand the role they could play and uh, and, and, and saw them as, as, as secondary to, to, to the tanks and what the tanks were, were, were going to do. Yeah, well, thank you for that, which brings us, I guess, to Operation Crusader, because it's come up several times, because although this is El Alamein fortnight, of course, El Alamein, you have to look at all the, the, the previous campaigns, because they all are part of the, I was going to say learning curve, but all, it's not always learning, it's always, it's, sometimes it's just repeating the same mistakes, but we'll we'll call it a learning curve to be, to be, to be polite to the commanders out there, but this is kind of the, the first big one for the South African contingent. So take us through their role in this and what went well and what went badly and, and, the, and basically okay. the South African point of view of everything. Okay, so what happened is when the South Africans arrived, they were they were stationed at Mercer Matru, where they proceeded to to uh, work on the defense of, defenses of Mercer Matru. While they were doing that, the New Zealanders were practicing their night operations. Very important in the desert. One of the most fundamental things is to be able to move at night. Rommel uh, achieved some unbelievable feats of uh, prowess during the during uh, sundown uh, during the during the night where he moved his troops. So it's very important in a, in, a, in an environment in a desert environment where there is no real cover and no concealment. Night acts as concealment, but the South Africans didn't really uh, uh, hone up their night skills and navigation skills. Navigation is also very important in in in, in the desert. They sat there building building the fortress of Mercer Matru. Um, they were called upon to be ready for the uh, Crusader operation uh, by November the 18th. Uh, some of their vehicles haven't arrived. They didn't feel that they had practiced enough. Uh, and, and, and they turned around. Uh, it was General George Brink, who was in charge of the 1st Division, turned around and said, listen, we, we, we're not ready. You need to delay this to November the 23rd. The British turned around and said, no, if you can't make it, we'll use somebody else. The, uh, the South Africans felt that, that they, they had to do it for to, to save face and honor, that they, they're going to have to be uh, involved. So they were very, very unprepared. Although they were veterans of East Africa, they were very, very unprepared for their role in Crusader, having not practiced in desert conditions, navigation not up to scratch, certainly reluctant to do night moves because they hadn't practiced that. Um, yeah, Crusaders is another operation. I don't know if you consider Crusader to be a British victory at all. Um, <laughs> That's been one of the things. Is it a victory? Is it a draw? Is it? it it's it, it's hard to hard to um, kind of classify. Every historian over the last two weeks has kind of a different view of it, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, we're interested. Well, in well, well, uh, maybe maybe you're here. interested in my view. I mean, I, I, I would like to. When when I look at these things, I look at the three different levels of war. I look at the strategic level, the operational level, and the tactical level. And I do believe that it was that it was a victory at the operational level. I think they did best, uh, uh, Rommel, and uh, they managed to relieve Tobruk. Uh, it, it was a messy. I think where where it, it I think where there's a problem it was a messy victory. It wasn't clear cut and whatever, but it, I, I think a victory it was. But let's leave it aside because that's that's a debatable point. Um, so what what the what uh, what the British intended for the South Africans was to mask the the left wing of the whole attack. Um, what the British wanted to do, and I don't want I don't want to rehash what maybe you've been through before. No, but, but we want British, your opinion. It it, it, it doesn't matter yeah. that we're we're around um, covering things multiple times. It's, it's okay, about great, your opinion. Great. So uh, please please. Okay, so the, so, so the British the British. The, the, the aim of the British was to entice the Germans to attack them and enter into an armored battle where they felt the British felt they had superior numbers, etc., and they would enter into this uh, into this huge armored battle and um, and uh, uh, destroy the German armor. Once they had destroyed the German armor, they would move on and and uh, and uh, relieve Tobruk, which was under siege at that stage. They chose a point on the map, Bir El Gubi. You've got it over there. Yep. Uh, it's, a, it's a map of no, it's, it's a point of absolutely no consequence whatsoever. Um, on November the 18th, the British uh, proceeded to attack. They arrived at Bir El Gubi. The weather was bad. 
Uh, Rommel had absolutely no idea that they arrived uh, at Biro. Gubi had no idea there was any threat whatsoever. So he didn't play. He didn't, he didn't act the way they wanted him to act, and he just carried on proceeding doing what he did. And there the British were at Birol Gubi. Having split their tank divisions again, not being able to concentrate properly, they split their, 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 their one tank brigade to, 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 uh, to mask the South Africans, to, to support the South Africans um, uh, on the left flank. And then the other tank brigade was, was left to support the uh, New Zealanders on 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 and, and, and the infantry on the right flank, and uh, they arrived with only one brigade at Birol Gobi. Anyway, already the whole plan was unraveling, so they decided uh, at this stage, okay, let us let us um, change the objective now to something that's more tangible. City Rose, which was more tangible, yeah, and they proceeded to to move on to City Rose, and that got Rommel's attention eventually. But now Rommel was able to, to concentrate his entire tank force together with the, well, not the Italians, the Italians are a different story. He was able to concentrate his two tank divisions against the individual British brigades, one at a time, instead of the British being able to consolidate all that. And um, I think the major problem with this whole campaign, the British at all stages thought they were winning these battles. Uh, and they thought that they were ahead of, on, in the numbers game. So they started off with, I can't remember exactly the figures, 700 tanks against the Axie 400, and they felt off the first and second day that they had that they had decimated the Germans. Meantime, the Germans were certainly not decimated. They'd used their anti-tank weapons and uh, taken an extremely bad, uh, extremely heavy toll on the British. But the major problem was for the British is that they underestimated uh, they overestimated the damage that they were causing to the to the Germans. The Germans were also fixing up their tanks. They occupied the the, the battlefield during the evenings, and the Germans had a great um, engineering corps that 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 fixed these tanks and made, managed to recover. They had a brilliant tank recovery units that managed to recover most of the losses from the previous day, where the British didn't recover their tanks or nor fix them. So. British German tank losses were very, very low. Anyway, the British and the South Africans were under the impression now that, that, that the German tanks were decimated. Uh, in the meantime, the Italians, who were totally underestimated, the Arietta tank division, totally underestimated, gave the British 22nd uh, Armored Brigade a good hiding, uh, which, exposed, which exposed the South African flank. And then the 22nd Armour Brigade, after getting a good hiding, uh, uh, joined the battle at City Rizeg, leaving the South Africans unprotected to now take on the Italians. So Pinot turned around and said, but hold on a moment. Uh, you, sent a tank to, you, sent, you sent a tank brigade there. They weren't able to dislodge the Italians. Now you're sending light infantry. So already there was a problem. The South Africans fielded two brigades. They fielded the 5th Brigade and the 1st Brigade. Pinot was in, in, in charge of the 1st Brigade. And... Armstrong is in charge of the 5th Brigade. And a gap started to open up between the 5th Brigade and the 1st Brigade because Pino was very, very reluctant to close the gap because of the Italian threat. And uh, the 5th Brigade was ordered now to proceed to City Rosaic pre prematurely because uh, they were only supposed to do so once the German tanks had been taken care of, which the British thought they had done to a certain extent. The Tobruk garrison was ordered to break out too soon also. And to cut a long story short, the South African 5th Brigade found itself isolated um, around the city of positions. British tanks totally decimated, not a factor anymore in the battle. And the Germans decided, no, now what they're going to do is they're going to, they're going to uh, uh, surround the, the British 1st Division. They didn't realize that the 1st Brigade was far away from the 5th. They're going to surround the 1st Division, the 26th Armored Brigade. I think it was the 4th Armored Brigade also. They're going to surround them and, uh, and, and crush them between uh, an, infantry, an, infantry, uh, 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 an infantry position uh, to the north and the tanks would be in the south, and together with Arietta, the Italians, they were going to attack. They were going to attack uh, the the uh, South Africans from the south. Luckily for the South Africans, um, it was only the fifth brigade that was uh, surrounded, but uh, against two German tank divisions and an Italian tank division, they stood no chance, and they were they were they were um, obliterated. Three thousand of them having been killed, wounded, 
and gone into activity. So the 5th Brigade was lost. Uh, Pinot just ran all over the battlefield for there on out. Didn't uh, was only interested in survival. Whatever orders he received from the British, he he he, he basically ignored did his own thing, putting false reports uh, because he was he was now worried that he was going to come to the same fate. So that was the up, unhappy fate of the South Africans in Crusader. Nevertheless, the attack on the Fifth Brigade tore the heart out of Rommel's Panzers because it was the first time, actually, in in the whole Crusader campaign that the Germans suffered grievous losses because they did a very reckless attack on the 5th Brigade positions and they faced anti-tank guns and and 25-pounders. And I think on that day, they lost more tanks than they had lost in the entire Crusader to that date. So they tore the heart out of of the German fighting power for the rest of the the Crusader campaign. But that's That's, where you um, said that there's there's different ways of looking at Crusader because... If you're at City Rizal, you're you're kind of seeing the worst of everything. We did a show with Peter Cox six months ago, whose whose uh, father was with the New Zealanders there, and you know it was a debacle in various points. And you know, and and yet, uh, if you look at the whole battle, yes, because of the loss of German tanks, you could, you know, and it ha- it it is an Allied victory. It just it's, it doesn't last very long. Is the theme that's coming up in the sidebar? It, it things change dramatically. But if you're if you're where the South Africans were. As we've been talking about of these previous two weeks, you're seeing everything that is exposing the weakness of the Allied situation. The lack of combined arms, the things that the Germans are doing well are the very things that the Allies are not doing very well. Mm. Communications, difference in doctrine, um, inability to, to react to things quick enough, leaving units le- or divisions leaving each other in the lurch because ex- fronts get exposed, all those, all those things there. So... This ultimately leads to, to deteriorating relationships between the South African commanders and, and the British commanders. So, Absolutely. So run through that a little bit, and then we'll move to Tobruk. Well, I mean, I mean, Pino, first of all, the South Africans were very, very uncomfortable to, 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 to have uh, been left uh, with, with, without any uh, uh, tank back up on the left wing of this whole operation, deep inside uh, hostile territory. Um, they didn't think much of the Italians, but the Italians actually turned out uh, turned out uh, to be quite a factor uh, on that particular day. And I mean, the, the 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 Italians the Italians alone caused caused the gap between the fifth brigade and the first brigade of Pinals. But Pinal walked away from that. I mean, absolutely, the South Africans were absolutely devastated that they had lost the fifth brigade like that. And so he. He just carried on running around uh, for the rest of Crusader. And I mean, so, so he, he had lost faith. He felt disappointed and lost faith in, what, in, in the way the British handled the South Africans. And, they, and the British lost faith in the way that Pinot was conducting himself by never closing up uh, onto City Rose, not backing up the 5th Brigade. And then after that, just running, running, running around the battlefield. So both walked away. Both uh, uh, the British and the South Africans walked away with a lot of uh, uh, mistrust between the, between them, certainly damaged the relationship between between the South Africans and and the British, losing their I mean, fifth brigade. As uh, I said to you, the South Africans very very sensitive to losses. Yeah, no, absolutely, and and we know that there's has been a bit of a pile on. Some British historians and British command at the time put some blame on South African units. They put some blame in New Zealand units rather than taking the blame themselves. There was a lack amongst a lot of the, the British commanders of of blaming their own friends because of the old boy network. This all came up yesterday with James Colvin. But for yeah. those who don't know, Pinar has, there's, there's, um, there's, there's a reason why his relationship with the British is always going to be strained. I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about his background, his childhood? Because the, these, I think, are important to understand the seeds of, 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 the difference. I mean, he, he's a highly decorated officer. We should make the point that he, you know, he, he he did his job very well in in the Western Desert. But there is there's there's this backstory. Yeah. That I think we should we should cover briefly. Yeah, well, Pino is a very colourful character. Um, he was a child in the South African War, the Anglo Boer War. He's he was actually interned in a concentration camp. Exactly, that um, was the point. To, to 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 together with a couple of other people. But he, the funny thing is that. He didn't emerge from those concentration camps as being totally anti-British. He didn't. He didn't emerge out of that. There were two. There were two streams that emerged from that type of experience on the South African War. You had the nationalists who were totally anti-British and wanted to wanted to tear themselves away from the British Empire, and you had those uh, Afrikaners following Smuts 
who saw a place underneath the uh, uh, in the bosom of the British Empire where they could f the, where they could mm. find a self expression, and he was one of those. So it, he he didn't come he didn't he didn't come out of the South African War particularly damaged uh, by by his experiences there. But, it, but um, it may not be damaged. But any any rose colored spectacles have gone away. He's not seeing. There are there are some people around the empire who see the yeah. empire as this wonderful cuddly kind of figure that's doing their best for them. He's seen enough of it to. He, he, you can you can be both things. You can be both pro your country and want to do yes. your duty, but also see that Point it isn't perfect. That there's a, there are there. It's not it's not all roses. And I think that's when I read about him. I see this. There's not a contradiction, that's too strong a word, but there's he, he's a realist, he understands the yes. world can is not yes. always a rosy place. I think that's the point yes. I want to make. No, absolutely. So, so, so he 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 joined the union, uh, the union defense. So, he was a policeman, he started off as a policeman, then joined the union defense force. One of the few officers to actually go on staff course to, to, uh, to the United Kingdom, first fought in the first world war, uh, under smuts. I think I think if I, I'm not mistaken, he was in, I don't think he was in Europe, but he was in German South East Africa and he was in, he was in uh, East Africa. I don't know. I don't know whether he found, I think he might've been in, 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 in Egypt during the first world war. So came out of there with a lot of, a lot of a, a first world war experience. Um, was also an alcoholic or an, an, a near alcoholic, uh, nearly cost him his career. And uh, he made up his mind just before the start of the Second World War. He turned around and he said, I will not drink another, until this war is over, I'll not touch another drop of booze, which he did, uh, he, which he did not touch. But a, but a colorful, checkered, uh, dynamic officer, uh, loved by his men, and uh, very much fought in the Boer way, in the Boer Republican style, uh, very much into maneuver, uh, had a lot of regard for his men, didn't want to waste his men's lives uselessly uh, in, in, in pursuing uh, Pyrrhic victories, etc., etc. So very much in the style of a, of a Boer-type general uh, who liked to devolve initiative down to the lowest levels, who liked to be mobile, who liked to envelop his enemy, who liked to psychologically unend his enemy, rather than entering into these, into these full-blooded frontal assaults uh, with loss of lives on both sides. So that's what that's more or less what he was all about. So in East Africa, he was able to, 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 to practice this type of warfare. And um, immediately, I mean, he was very outspoken also. He wasn't scared to, 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 uh, to voice his opinion, which he did on many, many occasions in East Africa to the British. Fell out with him on, on, on a lot of occasions. In fact, Got into Addis Ababa second because because uh, he had he had uh, some friction with the British generals. He turned around and said, "Right, just just send send in send in another division. Forget about Pinar because he's just uncooperative." So at times he came across as being obstinate, uncooperative, even accused of being a coward uh, for, for 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 not obeying all the British commands. At times, couldn't even call him insubordinate. So he was a real character. Yeah. And this is why, when if you're talking about this campaign, and we talked about the New Zealanders last week, is Freiburg, by by contrast, is everything Pienaar's not. Freiburg is a real Anglophile. He is British. He likes to kind of adopt things the British way with the New Zealanders. He, he, he very much joins in with the British doctrine, even if it's not the right one. Whereas Pienaar, right at the beginning, is his own man. He's South African. He's got his ideas about war. He's got his ideas. And you can understand, if you're a British commander, uh, you've got someone like Freiburg. Freiburg and, and Pienaar, I would think, are the two opposites of the of the various Commonwealth leaders that the British are having to deal with. In that, you know, Freiburg, as I said, is very, very pro-British and pro the British way, and Pienaar's the opposite. So basically, relations are, are deteriorating all over the place. And this is this is separate, of course, of Alcan, Alcanlick and 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 Ritchie and all these other people who are coming and going during this difficult period. But I think just to, just to, so we can cover the command of the other division, the second South African division, let's talk about this gentleman as well, briefly as well, because he, he's he's an important figure in the story. Okay, before before we, we, we talk about that, I just want to speak about Freiburg and the New Zealanders and the Australians. Yeah, now, the New Zealanders and the Australians were under charter. So they had they had recourse if they didn't if they didn't like one of the British orders, they had recourse to go to the Australian or the, or the New Zealand government and have that overturned. That's, That's not something the South Africans had. 
the South Africans were totally subordinate to the British. Yeah. How that came about, I'm not 100% sure. And the the New Zealanders used that charter on occasion. I mean, they turned around on, on, yeah, on occasion yeah, and said, yeah. no, we we out. Have a nice day. We're gone. So uh, it, it happened. So that's, that's an important distinction also, is that the South Africans – didn't really have recourse to go back to their government to get to get decisions overturned, so a lot of the burden uh, took place at at that at that level, you know, at divisional level, uh, without having the comfort of having a government come and say, "Whoa, you know, hold on, this is not where we want our South African troops to be." Um, one also has to be a little bit sympathetic to the British situation to try and keep all this in check. I mean, you can just imagine, you know, all these different nationalities, some with charters, some without charters, some are maverick drunkards. <laughs> insubordinate yeah. with yeah. different doctrines and whatever the situation. So, I mean, that the British held it together in itself is a miracle. You've got to admire them for that also. I so, mean, yeah, uh, and that, that's a that's a very good point there because, you know, I'm a Normandy man. So when we talk about Operation Overlord and the mostly har harm harmony that was going on between Americans, the Brits, the Poles, the French, everybody else involved in that, I suppose the big difference is, is that for two years of planning for Operation Overlord, they were mostly in the UK, not facing it, and they weren't engaged with the enemy really during that period. They were just training, and just at all the time, the Eighth Army are trying to understand how to win a war. They are engaged against the enemy. Maybe they're not in a full operational advance, but from from 90, early 1941 all the way onwards, they are always engaged. So there's never a break. There's never a moment to just kind of sit down. And perhaps, you know, all these commanding officers go off for a jolly, as we say in Britain, and go and do a you know, weekend in, in, a, in a seaside resort in England and just get to play pool and have fish and chips and stuff. There's none of that in North Africa because you're always, always fighting, aren't you? Yes, yes. So, so it makes improving relationships when you've got that stress of being in combat. I mean, they're not always in combat, combat, but they're in the line for huge periods of time with very little break. But... So thanks for those thumbnails. Well, well let, let's let's deal with um with this with this figure. Okay, uh, uh, Klopper is a, is is an is an interesting character. He has a product. He he entered the army in the 1930s. Very very young man when he became a general. Entered the army in the 1930s. Underwent uh, amphigarious training. I'm not going to go too much into detail. You can see his amphigarious wings on his tunic, and uh, which meant that he. He was uh, trained in the artillery, he was trained in the infantry, and he had his pilot's license, which was a requirement to join the permanent force in the South African army. So it was a type of uh, uh, low-level combined arms discipline that these guys went through. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. But anyway, but let's leave it out because it's not relevant to the, to the talk. So he was a, he was a general that cert certainly had staff schooling, uh, he'd been done his courses, or whatever. He was a staff officer. Um, and during the time of uh, Crusader, he was a he was a staff officer to the uh, brigade that took Bardia. He wrote out all the orders. Orders were very much in the British style. It was it was like a detailed command type of thing. I think the orders to take Bardia were sixty pages. Klopper had uh, uh, written them out, and uh, it covered every single eventuality, which is which is which is. Uh, a distinction between British and German doctrine. If you have a look at the orders that Klopper issued to attack Bardia, and you have a look at the orders that, that Rommel issued to attack the Brook, you'll see the difference. Hmm. One is a 60-page document, and the other is scribbled onto the back of a tissue <laughs> with a couple of arrows. So Rommel assembled his troops in the morning and said, you will do this, this, that, and that. And he devolved the initiative down to the lowest levels, and the Germans reacted to that within seconds without having one written order. And that's how they went about their business. Whereas certain components of the Allied forces didn't work that way. They didn't work that way. It just wasn't, wasn't, wasn't their doctrine. So that was the distinction. But this was a staff officer. This was a man who was of little experience, who didn't command troops in action at all. And he was, he was put into a position uh, of being the divisional commander, the, 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 the commander of the second division at Tobruk. Uh, one of the youngest South African generals, and must probably one of the one of the youngest generals of the war. I think he was forty years old uh, when he was given command of the Second South African Division. No real experience, quite a bit of enthusiasm. He was very confident that he'd be able to uh, to to defend Tobruk, and uh, 
well, we can see he was placed in a static position when he should yep. have been mobile because Which that's is. what the South Africans are all about. So once again, South Africans stuck on the Gazala line. The first division under Pinar stuck in a static position on the Gazala line. And the second division stuck into Brook in a static position, which is totally anathema to, to the way the South Africans fought, the, what they believed in and in their doctrine. Yeah, I mean, and this, and this it, would it be fair to say that to Brook and Gazala is the low point for the South Africans in North Africa? Or, or, or is, it, is there another low point that outlows it? No, I think this is this is this was definitely the low point. Um if we look at it from the German side, this is definitely one of the finest examples. If somebody says to me, What is maneuver warfare? So I'll say, Let me let me let me take you through this and show you what maneuver warfare is all about. <laughs> um it's the finest example of mission command tactics, maneuver warfare, combined arms uh, operations, uh movement at night deception it's one of the finest examples that i know uh it's it's an unbelievable battle unbelievable battle unfortunately the south africans came off second in it but um it's a great great example of 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 the power of a uh, maneuver uh overcoming overcoming basically what was a british position where they tried to they tried to force a static position on a very on a very mobile a type of situation um but obviously their left flank was totally open they could be enveloped on the left flank but uh minefields static positions etc etc so it's, it's quite incredible it's quite incredible what a, it, it's it's a great battle for army colleges and and this is when maybe the british idea of what happens in tobruk is perhaps written about differently in the historiography than the south african writing about it because it does end in lots of surrender. It does end in, in, in you know, defeat. Um, so in some cases, the British, well, not in many cases, the British are very critical of the South Africa. They're critical of the leadership there. How does how does a South African, which is thrown such as yourself, define the the, the what happened, the, the, the calamity at Tobruk from the South African point of view and, and, and essentially whose fault was it? Okay, so I would I would like to once again examine this at the three different levels of war because I think Please that's do. where we get our answers from. So if we look at it at the strategic and the operational, well, the tactical we don't have to go to. We can go a little bit to the tactical. But if you look at it from the strategic and operational uh, point of view, strategically wise, the South Africans were not to blame because there was a decision made uh, not to defend Tobruk. There was a decision made way before the Gazala battle that the, Tobruk, if it was encircled, was not to be defended. So everybody had that idea in their head. And right at the last minute, as the situation began to crumble on the Gazala line, it was decided by Auchinleck, uh, Churchill, Smuts was also involved, that Tobruk was to be defended, which went totally against what was decided in the first place. So there was just a total mix-up with Ritchie. So Ritchie misunderstood the orders, and instead of withdrawing withdrawing to a line where Tobruk would have been the northern part of that defense, he withdrew way past that and left Tobruk isolated. It wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, to 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 total mix-up because the, the plans were changed at the last minute. Not Klopper's fault. Absolutely not Klopper's fault at a strategic level. That he found himself surrounded, not his fault. It was hmm. totally a problem at the strategic level. Um, at the operational, he certainly didn't acquit himself well at the operational and the tactical level. He made many, many mistakes in Tobruk uh, due to his inexperience, due to not being able to combine his, uh, his forces properly. We, we mustn't forget, first of all, this, this myth that the, the defenses of Tobruk had been denuded to arm the Gazala line is not true. Klopper himself admits in his court of inquiry, admits that the defences of Tobruk were quite intact and quite good and quite comparable to the first first time Tobruk was enveloped and the Australians held it quite successfully. He outnumbered the Germans in tanks. Uh, I think he had 63 tanks against Rommel's 43 tanks. He had anti-tank weapons and he certainly outnumbered, uh, uh, outnumbered Rommel in the amount of men that he had defending the uh, location. Uh, Rommel's troops were totally exhausted after having fought these cauldron battles, whatever. When they arrived, they were asleep on, on their feet. In fact, many, many South Africans who escaped just walked past Germans who, was, who, who were fast asleep. So 
you, we, we can't even say that Rommel was in great condition at the end of the day. They were also at the end of the tether after fighting long and hard for, for, for the six weeks prior to that. So I would say to you, if you want to lay blame, if you can lay blame at, at General's feet, if you want to lay blame, I would say to you at the operation and tactical level, he was definitely below par. And he had a number of options that he could have taken that, that wouldn't have landed up in surrender. Certainly with 33,000 men um, and, his brigade, and, and, his, and his brigades that were sitting there, the South African brigades being highly mobile, he could have broken out at any time because he had numbered the Germans at any one point many, many times. So he hmm. could have taken the initiative on himself and decided to break out much the same as Paulus could have done at Stalingrad. Uh, Klopper, who was in a far easier situation, could have done that. So it needn't have la landed up in a surrender. But he decided to stick it out and, and surrender very, very early. So he's, he's, he's got a lot to answer for when it comes to that battle. Yep. It's interesting you made the Paulus comparison because I was thinking of making a Percival at Singapore comparison because it's maybe the tactical. Yeah, he didn't cover himself with glory with the defense of Singapore, but no. it was at the tactical level of the of the whole Singapore plan being inherently flawed that got him into the situation where he had was 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 in the situation where he had Japanese coming down a Malaya Peninsula. So I was going to make the Paulus connection is very is, or comparison is very applicable, but I think Percival is also a good one. But yes. let's let's move on from Tobruk and then we talk about um the. The, the whether we want to call it the first battle of El Alamein or the battle of Alam Halfa, because we're, we're back to the first South African division. So there they are. You can see them on the map there, folks. They are south um, uh, west of El Alamein. So um, run us through the South African involvement in the battle of Alam Halfa. Yeah. Well, well, let's not let's not leave. Uh, uh, let's let's just go back to Gazala quickly because we haven't sure, covered Pinar. Yeah, 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 please. We yeah. haven't covered Pinar because which is which is which is quite interesting. So. Pinar's position was 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 right at first South African division. You can see it really right at the north over there. That was that was his position. Very very uncomfortable sitting there, uh, mainly faced by the Italians. Yeah. Um, very uncomfortable that he's sitting in a static position, not allowed to move around, and ordered from time to time in order to relieve the pressure that was now happening down at Bir Hakim and and south, ordered from time to time to make attacks, to make frontal attacks on the Italians facing him. And once again, I don't have to explain to you this, the, the, the way South Africans feel about frontal attacks and making fruitless attacks <laughs> to, to create a diversion for something many, many miles away from him. So he just disobeyed his orders. When he was supposed to send out a battalion, he sent out a, a platoon, you know, that type of thing. So he just, he just hedged his bets all the, all the time on the Gazala lines and, uh, and uh, used whatever excuse he could not to cooperate with the British in, 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 in fruitless attacks uh, on the Italians to try and relieve the situation, the situation down, to, down south. On many occasions, he considered just gapping it and getting out of there and, uh, and retreating. But luckily, the retreat order came from the British before he decided to retreat. And uh, with alacrity, he retreated through Tobruk. He left a, he left a component of his, of his uh, first division in, in Tobruk. But the majority of it now retreated back to um, uh, retreated backwards towards uh, Alamein. Yep. Uh, he was told to stop at a number of occasions. One was at Salum, where he refused to defend that because he didn't want to be cut off, and he carried on. Uh, he was also told to retreat there. So he he was at now at this stage very very obstinate and uh, totally un uh, not trusting the British, and 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 just wanting to survive only looking to survive uh, him and his first first division. So, you, the, the, and building up now, building up quite a level of distrust between himself and the British at this stage, you could see that they could not rely on him to do to do anything. Well, that's a brilliant analysis. And we're, get, we're, you know, we're, we're in the middle of the summer of 1942 now. So, although Montgomery is as yet to arrive, the teams are in place now. There's going to be no, no new units really coming to North Africa. Everybody has just got to work through these difficulties now because the, we're in the middle of this storm now. The, 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 the war in Western Desert is, is only cranking up in tension. So everybody's got to play. We've all got to play with each other, whether we whether we want to or not now. there's So all, all the commanders, South African, New Zealand, Australian, French, British, they're all in it for the, for, for the, for till there's a conclusion to this now. So, Thanks for your brilliant um, summary of, of the Gazala line there. But let, yeah, so we, we're moving up to the Battle of Alam Halfa again. So relations have, have, have soured even more between Pinar and, and 
basically everybody else. Um, what what next for the South Africans is you know, because you know they're, they're, they've lost they've lost people. They 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 are they getting any new um, reinforcements at this point? I guess they're not, are they? No, 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 they're not. They're not. In fact, now they've lost the uh, they've lost the second division that's gone into captivity. Yep. Uh, it's down to the first division under 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 Pinar with these three brigades, and uh, they are earmarked now to defend Alamein. And something's changed now on the British front because for the first time in the Desert War, they are able to um, anchor their left wing on the Kotara Depression. Yeah. So no longer has Rommel got the option now of in, of, of of an envelopment down south. So the British now have found themselves in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a stronger position because it's it's a type of warfare they understand. They have now, instead of like a Gazala trying to impose a static position, they now have a more or less natural static position with the Quatara Depression down south and the, and and the, and the coast, the the sea coast up up north. And I think it's a six. I think from Alamein down to the Quatara Depression, correct me if I'm wrong, is about sixty kilometers. So there's a sixty kilometer stretch that they now have to. Um, have to defend uh, far more comfortable now in that type of position. They place the Pinar in Alamein. Uh, he is, again, very uncomfortable at Alamein uh, because he's, again, placed in a, in a, in a, in a static position uh, where he would rather be mobile uh, and, and allowed to attack when he could attack and retreat, etc. Uh, he would rather maneuver now than be, than, than, than be static. Um, at this stage, Auchinleck changes changes doctrine slightly. Uh, he's looking to be more mobile and have more combined uh, uh, combined arms. So he turns around and he says, uh, "I don't want really want a static position here. I want more mobility. I want people to respond in a mobile way to where the Germans are coming." And with that, uh, funny enough, Pinar countermands him and turns around and says, no, we must actually stand fast. And he, now he decides to stand fast. He, he goes totally, he's contrarian to, 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 to what the British are asking him to do now. So he makes a decision that, uh, together with Gott, I think, also, who was around at that time, he, that, that, that they would rather stand fast. But as a concession, they kept one brigade forward and took two brigades back to be, uh, to, to be mobile, and the one would be static up front. So that's a position that they found themselves in gathering along here, setting up the defenses and um, trying now, British determined now not to, not to use their army in penny packets, but mm. try and consolidate it and, and, uh, and, 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 and use their armor as, as one instead of little penny packets all over the line trying to defend the, the infantry. But it's obviously a much more defensible position than they've had before because they had number the, uh, they had number the axi in, uh, in artillery, they had number yeah. them uh, in, in in a lot of different areas, so it's quite a strong position now. And I mean, ro- I th- the one thing with maneuver warfare, if you're using the psychological aspect of maneuver warfare to psychologically dislocate your enemy from positions that they're holding, which he did up to now perfectly well, this was where the sta- well, this was the stage where the psychology changed a bit, where they decided this it's it's here and no further. We're not going one inch back. And the psychological aspect didn't work, and it would have to be a slogging match. And Rommel just didn't have the means to to enter into a proper slogging match over here. He wasn't going to win the numbers game uh, once he couldn't play the psychological game. So that's where we found the South Africans on the eve of of the German attack. Brilliant. So, uh, and just just to um, remind ourselves, because Montgomery is entering the arena, Montgomery... For example, you mentioned artillery a minute ago. With his General Kirkman, he he looks at what the New Zealanders are doing with artillery, what the Australians are doing with artillery, adopts some of those practices for the for the for the stonks and things like that. Pienaar's relationship with the previous commanders was not very good. How does he get on um, with Montgomery? And does Montgomery take any or or Montgomery's staff look at anything South African units have been doing and say this is a good idea, let's adopt that, or does he bring them into his way of thinking? Okay, we, 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 we haven't got to that stage yet because, okay. because there's Orkin is still in charge of this whole lot. Okay. And the, the Germans unleash the, the, the attack. Oh, yeah, we've, they, yeah we've, sorry, we've got to do the counterattack. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, we, I'm, they, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm skipping ahead. No, no, no. It's not, <laughs> it's not a problem at all. I don't mind even skipping ahead. But this, 
If you ask me where South Africa's finest moment in the desert war, it's this. I don't want, I don't, okay, I don't want let, to skip let, it. Let's do it then. Yeah, this, I'm, I'm this, having a way of time. Is, this, I think this is their finest moment. Right. <laughs> not the not the other, not not the third or the uh, the second other. This is second their second or moment. third, whichever one we want to call it. Yeah, every yeah, yeah. historian has uh, disagreed uh, about which one it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So so Rommel sends in his Italians to attack the South Africans. The South Africans don't budge. They've got artillery. Uh, they they manage to stop the Italians in their tracks. He sends in the 90th light to uh, surround the South Africans at Alamein. He tries to pull another Gazala by surrounding, hoping, hoping that the South Africans will just surrender and give up. Um, he, he aims incorrectly. He lands up, the 90th light lands up directly in the, in the South African defenses where they are decimated and actually crack. For the first time, the, line, the 90th light actually cracks because of the South African defenses. So... It's one of it's 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 South Africa's finest moment, where uh, they the, the held fast, and in some ways more important than the final Alamein, because if this had gone wrong, there wouldn't have been another Alamein. So at least I can take mm. some credit, and quite a lot of credit now for stopping the the the, the actually in the tracks and, and 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 turning Rommel back at a crucial at quite a crucial point. Not that it there weren't problems now with um uh with with the British generals and 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 Pinar. Because mistakenly, uh, he was subject to a, a British air attack at Alamein, and he sent a dirty uh, correspondence back to say, listen, uh, if you want me to change sides, I'll change sides. I have no problem in invading Alexandria together with Rommel if you, con if you continue to bomb my, my, my positions and that type of thing. So that's the, that's the bitterness uh, <laughs> at that stage. Um, Auchinleck turned around to Pinar and said to him, if you, if you, I'm trying to remember these words exactly. He said, "If you, if you retreat from this position, you can take credit for bringing down the British Empire." Or words to that effect. So that's the acrimonious nature of what was happening at uh, at, at at First Alamein. Anyway, it turned out well. The Germans were stopped in their track. No, I mean this, and this is it's brilliant. Again, like my other guests these last two weeks, the the, prob the South African problems with Pinar getting on with people are just exposing the 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 big problems the eighth army have is just getting anything to work well i mean everything's not working well so even when they're having victories it's still not because they're getting things right it's because of bravery of individual people that there's still something inherently wrong with how the structure and the organization of the eighth army absolutely, is, is absolutely, set up absolutely. it's not not it, not, these, not 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 to be solved I, I don't think it was solved in the desert i doubt whether it was solved in europe and I must tell you, yeah, yeah, let, 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 let's face it, a lot of armies were struggling for a long time post-war to, 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 to adopt this type of German flexible yeah. maneuver uh, and command structure that the, that, 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 that the Germans had. And it's a very, very difficult system to replicate because it's a matter of culture. Uh, yeah, I mean, and the, the, the point not, came up I, I don't have that culture. The, the Germans have, have been streamlining everything together. The Luftwaffe has been set up to work alongside the army pretty much from its inception. Absolutely. Everything has been set up to work to, to one system. I'm, I'm kind of thinking of the way Germany was running its football team about 15 years ago with the youth team and the, and the under-23s and the first team all playing the same system. The British, the Commonwealth have been pulling in different directions for, for decades since the end of the First World War. There's little heart and people like that want to do one thing. There's other they're bobbing, borrowing ideas from Gajarian for other things. Everybody's everybody's got ideas, but they're not they're not going in the same direction. And these early Western desert campaigns uh, battles are just exposing this this foundation that is is not strong. Um, but even though, as we said earlier, Crusader was a victory, albeit a temporary one, it's still it's still not really curing anything. Um, no, but but no. but the South Africa's role really interesting. So um, if if yeah, well let, well let's keep on going. I'm I'm loving it. Let's just whatever you want to talk about next, you talk about it because it's brilliant. Well, I mean, I just 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 on the theme because I think it's also interesting is that um, a lot of the Allied forces after the war tried to try to adopt German military doctrine. Uh, if you have a look at if you have a look at the current American doctrine, in fact, the current NATO doctrine, doctrine it's all Bundeswehr Wehrmacht type yeah, yeah. Of, of, of doctrine. Um, after the Second World War, a lot of the captured German generals went over to the United States to help them with their doctrine and actually uh, write their doctrine for them and that type of thing. So, 
a lot of the Western armies try and aspire to, to look like the German army, have the same type of command structure, that mission command, outtrucks, tactic type of, yep. of structure, uh, combined arms, warfare, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that the Germans just do so damn well at the operation, at the tactical level. Germans are not great at the strategic level. Not great because of their doctrine. Their doctrine doesn't, the doctrine doesn't really lend itself to being strategically uh, great, but it certainly lends itself to being operationally and tactical great. Hence, we say the British win all their wars, lose a lot of their battles, and the Germans are the opposite. They lose a lot of their wars and win a lot of their battles. But the interesting point is this, what I'm trying to say to you. Up to the 80s and the 90s, where all these European armies, including the British and the Americans, were trying to adopt German doctrine, basically trying to take over German doctrine. They failed miserably. Uh, they had 30, 40 years to do it, and they still failed. Here, you, here you're looking at the British, in a matter of months, they had to adapt and change the way they did business. Uh, they weren't going to achieve it in a matter of months, where it took the NATO armies 30, 40 years to try and do it, and they're still unsuccessful to this day, because it's a cultural thing. It's very, very cultural. To, yeah. devolve, to devolve authority and allow people initiative down from where you are is, is a cultural thing. It's not an easy thing to do, even in business. You know, you're the boss. You're the boss. You don't say, listen, guys, here's a project. You go and run with it. You know, in an ideal world, that's, that's how the Germans work. They say, here's a, this, is what, this, is my, my, this is my aim. I want you to go out there and fulfill my aim. How you do it, I don't actually give a damn. You do whatever you want to do. It was the British and American tendency to interfere from the top, to try and conduct events from the top. Even though they paid lip service to saying, listen, we're going to devolve authority down to the lowest levels and allow people in the thick of battle to make the decisions where they have to make the decisions. They never let go. Even the Americans yeah. in Afghanistan, etc., never really let go at the end of the day. Always from the top, there's always a general trying to intervene, which went against exactly what the Germans were trying to do. The Germans, it was in their doctrine, where a German superior officer was not allowed to, 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 to issue instructions on the conduct of the battle to his juniors, yeah. uh, unless there were dire circumstances. They were allowed, they were allowed to, 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 to use their own initiative or whatever. That doesn't come easy. That's not an easy thing to do. That's a culture that goes back hundreds of years, a doctrine that goes back and, hundreds and, and, of years. Which is why, when we, we're going to bring Montgomery into things, is that even if the British were given some magical handbook of how German doctrine works, explaining its origins, how it, the system, the structure, and they were given this magic recipe for warfare. You can't adopt a doctrine overnight. You can't adopt no. a doctrine over year. It would take a generation. And as you say, with yes. the, the, the Allies were still failing 40 and 50 years after World War II, yeah. which brings us to the another recurring theme that's been coming up these two weeks is that when Montgomery comes in, is don't don't try and do what the Germans do. Try and do what the Eighth Army has more potential of being able to do absolutely. by not throwing out the baby absolutely. with the bathwater. Absolutely. Look at what yeah. has been working but not working well. Improve it, hone it, um, and and get it to work to work. So it, which brings us to the kind of point of of of, of getting towards the second battle of Alamein or the third, if we want to talk about the third. Um, and Montgomery's arrival, and how and what impact that had for the South Africans. Well, you see, Montgomery's been accused of being dull and boring, and he most probably was dull and boring because what he what he did is he did what the British Army and the and the Australian Army at the Brook proved they're very very good at is is conducting warfare from a static position. They were great. They were great in the First World War about it. They know how to sort out the artillery. They know how to work the timetables. They know how to. Uh, to, to get uh, overwhelming firepower down on a certain point. They know how to combine arms at that type of level on a timetable basis. So they felt very comfortable. So my, all Montgomery did was come there and do what the British Army was damn good at. Uh, and the circum the territorial circumstances allowed for that because, as you can see, they, the, 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 the left flank now, was anchored on the Katara depression. There wasn't an opportunity for Rommel to envelop the situation, whatever. So Montgomery could come along and uh, besides increasing morale and doing what he did very well, but he could come along now, build up his forces, uh, basically maintain a static position and fight a battle of attrition. And if he could sit and fight a, a solid battle of attrition, he was going to win the numbers game because the 
Eighth Army totally had, had, had numbered the Axie. Their lines were short. The logistic lines were much shorter than what the Axie lines were, um, et cetera, et cetera. The advantage was just with the British if they fought the type of war that Montgomery was prepared to fight, which was uh, to, to use overwhelming force, firepower, and numbers to overcome the Germans. And I mean, that that is basically what Alemany is all about, unless I'm mistaken. No, it's 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 been the um been the been the theme, and and it came up yes, and it came up earlier today is at, when we get to the beginning of the second battle of Alamein, Alamein, because you said there about having that base on his left flank, is that Rommel arguably has the worst geographical position now, um, and Montgomery has the better geographical position. Would you yes. agree with that? No, absolutely, and 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 the Eighth Army have got the a much shorter logistical line, very yeah. very important. Yeah. And and did they, you know, we, I referenced earlier the fact that Montgomery borrows some artillery ideas from the, from the Kiwis and the Aussies. And how how does his relationship go on a personal level with Pinar? Well, Pinar felt a hell of a lot more comfortable with Montgomery. When he met him Montgomery for the first time, uh, he turned around and, and, and he said words to the fact is that that's a man that I can work with. That's mm. a man that I can work with. But behind the scenes, um, Pinar had let all his non-crucial personnel go back to Alexandria because he wanted, if anything went wrong, he wanted to save some of the South Africans that they, that they, that they, that they, that they could later uh, go back to South Africa. In fact, he was so concerned about it that um, they were planning how they were going to get back to South Africa through <laughs> by going south if they were defeated, that they would just gap it all the way back to South Africa. I mean, these are the type of ideas. They had no confidence. They were very, very worried about how the British were going to conduct themselves. With Montgomery's arrival, the situation uh, alleviated themselves. They, he certainly felt more comfortable uh, with Montgomery. I think Montgomery is more of a people's person than Auckland Lek. Yeah. And uh, uh, certainly um, knew, he knew how to massage he, uh, the, the, the people underneath him. I mean that well, that was that was the, the I think it was John Parcel brought up I think Zeta brought up last week is that Montgomery has been regarded for a long time as not getting on with people but he tends to get on with people either at the same level as him or people who are higher up than him he does tend to get on with people who are subordinate to him quite well because he appoints his yes. people pretty well and he makes that job of of of, of speaking to them and getting on with people so. You know, he's seen as not getting on with people, but he can get on with people. It's it's he has to kind of choose the ones he wants to. It's a weird way of saying things. But Absolutely. um, but you explaining how the, the South Africans have almost got their kind of in monopoly get out of jail card free. I have no problem with that. I mean, they've been let down by the British command. They've they've lost a lot of people. As you say, the whole South African doctrine is hit and run and all, let's all go but let's all go home if we can alive and uh, no one wants to go down with the ship at this point there's what was it Patton said you know no you, the idea is not to die for your country the idea is to make some other poor sucker die for his country that's that's yeah. kind of the south african way isn't it there's anybody <laughs> sure. can be brave in death but better to be brave and come home surely yeah. As I say, they were they were they were very sensitive to uh, uh, to, to losses back at home. They're worried about the whole front. Listen, there was problems on the whole front. I've alluded to that already. Is that yeah. a large proportion of the population did not support the war? Uh, so Smuts was in a very tenuous position. Certainly, yeah. when 30, th uh, well, not thirty three thousand South Africans, thirty three thousand uh, Allied troops went into captivity in Tobruk, but at least eleven twelve thousand. Uh, South Africans went into cap uh, captivity at Tobruk. There were another couple of thousand from City Rizag. There were a lot of there were a lot of South Africans in captivity at this stage. A lot of deaths, and the situation back home was very precarious. There was a political situation. There was not a lot of support for the war, and he had to be very very careful with how he conducted himself and, and the type of losses that were reported back on the on the home front, because the situation there could be turned very very quickly. And in fact, on visiting. This front in November, Jan Smuts came to visit uh, in Egypt in November uh, of that year. He withdrew the South Africans totally, much to the surprise of the British. He said to them, you know what, you guys, you guys are going home. And within a couple of weeks, uh, the South Africans had packed up. They'd left some of their, some of their reconnaissance forces behind. But the, but the divisions had packed up and um, gone back home. Uh, much to the surprise of Churchill, who was quite disappointed about it that the mm. South Africans had pulled out at that stage. Um, Pinar died in a plane crash on his way back to South Africa. Um, yeah. 
I think he died some in East Africa in in in, in their plane crash. And and all the crew was it eleven people on the plane or aircraft or something like that, wasn't it? Yes, it was a yes. Big, big tragedy. Um. Yeah, so yeah. And it's and it's reminding us because as a Brit, we know and it's come up in the conversation that Churchill is 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 suffering politically in the summer of 40 he needs a victory or the the early autumn of 42 he needs a victory uh, yep. there's a there's there's a suggestion that you know that he, he's not the right leader montgomery is under some pressure but he's got a bit of leeway but he needs to get churchill that victory because churchill wants it. alexander is in the mix as well because alexander is a friend of both of them and, and so on and so forth and, and now you're giving us the fact that the south african i hadn't thought about it from the south african home point of view as you said some of the country are not even behind the war effort there's now been lots of south africans taken prisoner a whole lot wounded a whole lot are dead and 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 again as you said the ex it's exposed the difficult relationship with the british so it's a it's a it's a potential um uh a storm brewing but let's yes. go through the south african involvement in the second battle of al alamein and uh, it, although it's not as dramatic in some ways as the earlier battles but to to round things off yeah, no, certainly they 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 they, they played a minor role. Uh, I don't think it was a major role. You'd know more about it than I do. Uh, it's not really my field of of expertise uh, on, on on that other main. But I think uh, the British were very very cautious to use them. In fact, um, it was Montgomery who turned around at that stage and said, "We have to be very very careful the way we use the South African forces going forward because they are fragile and fickle." And uh, so I think to a certain extent they were protected uh, and, 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 and looked after to a certain extent because I think Montgomery was sensitive also to the political situation that was happening. South Africans themselves felt that Pinot was very, very fragile at this stage also. So uh, very tentative, I mean, in, in, in this battle of Alamein. South Africans were very, very tentative and uh, was probably cared for a lot more than, uh, than, than, than it previously had been. Certainly yeah, I mean, off. It came up with Julio on the show about the Italian army because they end up being involved on the fringes of the last stand of the Arietti division and things like that. But they, you're right, they don't have the absolute pivotal role in the second yes. battle, which is, uh, you know, having been through what they've been through, who, who could... I know, think by design, uh, uh, Paul, I think by design they were not put in there yeah, as, as no, a exactly. pivotal role. Yeah. So we'll we'll we we'll we'll kind of bring things to an end. But I'm I'm looking interested in more opinions now about about you know you said at the, at the moment at the beginning that South Africa is not really looking back at its World War II past very much, but there are this kind of hardcore who do. Um, in terms of yourself, are you one of a a kind of a, a buoyant community of people looking at World War II history? Or are you or are you a bit of a kind of a lone ship on the horizon at the moment? No, actually not. Uh, uh, very interestingly, we have a little node. Can we call it a node of excellence out at the South African Army, uh, uh, the South African Military Academy, based in Soldana, uh, which is a faculty is is the Faculty of Military Science for Stellenbosch University. So we run where the, the 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 military academy runs its own little uh, history department and military science department as a faculty of Stellenbosch. So we are, we are away from the main campus in a, in a beautiful little town mm -hmm. called Saldana on the, on, on, on the west coast. And there's a small group of us who are very, very interested in, uh, in following South African doctrine and revitalizing our history, which I think is important because, I mean, history is just absolutely, never mind just for the, for the military, and I come, from, I come from, from a military point of view over yeah, here. Yeah. It's fundamental to the military, but it's also fundamental to South African society, whether we like it or not here. Uh, we have a common history. Um, we all fought in the Second World War. All of us, blacks, whites, whatever, fought in the Second World War. We each had one objective, was to better our lot for our families and for our friends and for our people. Uh, whether it was for economic reasons or we fought out of conviction, whatever it was, we expected to go away and fight and come back to a better South Africa for whatever reason. So we have a lot in common. And it was very, very important to all of us. So we, we have to have that history. We can't discard that history. History tells us where, where we've come from. It tells us how we got to where we are now. And it gives us a slight indication of, of where we're going to go in the future. So it can't be discarded. So we, we're vehement about that at the Academy, is that we are going to reopen up the, 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 the discourse. We're going to reinterpret what went on before. We are going to try and make re history relevant to the greater South African population where there wasn't relevancy before, and I can perfectly understand it because this is a divided society. 
um, it's a conflicted society in many, many ways. But we have a commonality that we need that we need to look at. You know, we've all died together on the battlefield, no matter what. Well, what I color mean, creed. that that's a perfect point. And I think you know, that speaking as a Brit, and I live in France, and my American friends is that I, I, we've never been more divided. Britain is split right down the middle because of Brexit, because of politics. America's split down the middle because of politics. France has similar problems. Europe has problems. Your very your 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 point about everybody fighting World War II to want to come out of it better for themselves. That's the common thread, although how they would define what better is depends yes. on moving from country to country and person to person. India's ambitions being different to perhaps the United Kingdom's or Australia's and New Zealand. But the, the fact that they we all had at heart this common cause of bettering ourselves and, of course, defeating a very evil um, enemy. Yeah, the, the, what the Third Reich and the Japanese stood for was was inherently evil and needed people to come together. So given that my country and your country and America and the Netherlands, we've all had these complicated history of fighting with each other and against each other and, and, and causes that have come together and not come together. At its heart, World War II is a coming together, isn't it? That's it is a coming together of people for a common good. And I think that's why it should be um, still continue to be talked about. But one last question for you, then we will bring things to an end. Obviously, you're well read, you're, you're expert, and people absolutely love it. I've got so many requests to bring you back for something else because they love you, which is great. So that's brilliant. But you obviously read widely. You you read American histories, British histories, and you, know, you don't just confine yourself to the South African histories. What? How do you think South Africa is written about when it's written about by people around the world? Well, badly? Is it a mixed bag? I mean, without naming names particularly, but do you do you kind of sometimes throw books across the room and go, how you know, why don't they speak to South Africans? What's your feeling about how the world writes about you with regards to World War II? No, I think I think we've we're very much on the periphery when it comes to to our role in the First World War and the Second World War, uh, sideshows. So, certainly, First World War, you know, we, we would consider the sideshow. Jan Smuts in the First World War got a very, very raw deal by British historians, his contemporary British historians, as well as current British historians. Yeah. And uh, I've gone some way to undo, un unraveling and undoing that in my latest book that I wrote on, 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 on Jan Smuts and his First World War. So I would say, yeah, in the main South Africans have been uh, have been uh, ignored. Their contribution, their role maybe is the word. Yeah, marginalized. I mean, it's it, marginalized it's, to a certain extent. I mean, I had a little graph up here that I haven't loaded up, but I can just load it for myself quickly. Just give you some figures about South Africa's contribution to. I've got you. South Africa's diminishing contribution to the Allied fighting power, nineteen forty one to nineteen forty four. East Africa. We contributed 35% of the brigades to, to East Africa. That's quite a huge contribution. Yeah. North Africa and Crusader, we made up 20, 22% of the brigades. Uh, Gazala, we were down to 20%. Madagascar, we made up 25% of the forces in that campaign. Uh, Second Alamein, we were down to eight, we were down to eight percent. And once the Americans came in, we were totally marginalized. We weren't a factor anymore. So in North Africa, Tunisia, we were down to basically zero percent. In uh, in Italy, we contributed four percent of uh, of the uh, of the component of the fighting power component. So I think the turning point was when the Americans came into the war uh, and started to put their forces. In. We, we 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 weren't a factor anymore. We were very important to Britain right in the beginning. Uh, Politically, I think we yeah, supported yeah, the yeah. British, and, and and I think Churchill needed that. He had a great relationship with Jan Smuts, and he really appreciated Jan Smuts' input and everything like that. Certainly, militarily, in the, in the East African campaign and the early North African campaigns, we 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 made a, a, a large contribution, and it hasn't, it, it no, it hasn't been recognised either at home. I mean, we 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 also to blame. I mean, if we don't even recognise it at home, how do we expect other people to recognise it? But that's yeah, true. I hope we, we I hope we're redressing that at the academy in that department. I and we so. haven't even addressed the South African squadrons within the Desert Air Force, which we did. It did come up in a show last year with the historian yes. Ken Dell of how important yeah. they were. That Not was, my area of expertise, but yeah, yes. But numerically, that Berlin, was huge as well. Yeah. Berlin airlift. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Korean, yeah. Co Korean War. We had a squadron. We had a squadron in the Korean War. Uh, yeah. These are, I mean, we've made it. We've, we've certainly made a contribution. And to the doctrine. Like you said, yeah. the British, yeah, yeah. a lot of the British doctrine 
uh, comes from the South African. Uh, South Af that is recognised, by the way. The the, the Anglo-Boer War is quite well recognised as being a fundamental point in 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 altering. Uh, British doctrine in, in, in that period. Well, I so mean, in, 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 when Churchill does his famous Butcher and Bolt plea in 1940, when you look at the, the longer documents that he's producing at that time, he's making numerous references to the Boer War and the, and the, and the tactics and command, uh, what you know, adopting the word. I mean, the fact he used the word commander, that, that the fact that that was cho chosen, he, he absolutely re realized the importance of a mobile war, this hit and run, these, these raids that ha can have an effect on logistics and rear, rear lines and, and morale and, and public opinion and, and so on and so forth. So we could come back and talk about that in the future. We will bring, bring things to him because it's been absolutely amazing talking to David. You are going to get an invitation to come back. I, it's pushed me on to want to do a week about, or at least a week, maybe two weeks about the East African campaign. Julio, my Italian historian, wants to come and talk about the Italians out there because you said half a million Italians on that on that uh, uh, area. And then there's Madagascar we have talked about, but there's lots there. There's the West African troops we haven't covered yet. Those from um, uh, the, 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 and we did, I mean, one of the things we did talk about, we did talk about uh, Durban. Uh, Gene uh, Smith came on a story and 30,000 transport ships went through Durban in World War II, which yeah. I was amazed at when I had that figure. Yes. Um, in, just incredible. So we can do more about South Africa, but we will bring things to the end now. So, folks, don't forget we have our panel show on Monday. Three guests coming back to round up lessons learned and indeed lessons not learned from the desert campaign. So that's Monday. Then I've got uh, uh, Damien Lewis on Tuesday. Then I've got a few days after them going to Germany. Then it's Sino Japanese War Week. But anyway, David, it's been absolutely brilliant talking to you. Um, you said about your book about Jan, Jan Smuts. Your, the link to your book about South Africa and Western Desert is in the description below. What are you working on next? Um, we're working on 20, 20 battles uh, that define South African military doctrine, 20 battles in the in the 20th and 21st century. So we're going to be talking about some of the modern battles also that South Africa has found itself in, invasion of Lesotho that, that occurred in, uh, in, in, in 95 or 96, Battle of Bangui up in the Central African Republic. Wow. Uh, and we're going to link it right back and try and find that golden thread of doctrine that goes through all those battles. So it's a bit of an instructional book also. For, well, for the army colleges, but I think it's going to be very readable by people that are interested. Brilliant. That's what on we're working behalf, on right now. On behalf of the military community around the world who watch my channel, thank you for what you're doing for pushing South Africans' history out there, and thank you for bringing your knowledge to us, because I can assure you that everybody watching today, it's been a massive, great learning curve. We went into this knowing very little about the South African involvement. We've all come out learning, learning a whole lot more, so thank you so much for the my bottom of my heart for joining us. So, um, this is Paul Woodhead from World War II TV. I will see you all next week. Have a good weekend, everybody. Cheers. Bye.